So good evening to you all. Um, my name is Alison Brammer. I'm the head of the School of Law at Kiel University and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first Grand Challenges lecture of this season from the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences together with the School of Law at Kiel. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Michael Mansfield Casey, I have to remember it's KC now, not QC, um, who's going to talk to us on the theme of time for justice. So Michael will be known to many of you as uh, I think he can fairly be described as the UK's most prominent and high profile defence lawyer. We're proud to say that he's one of Kiel's most famous alumni, having studied philosophy in the 1960s. In a long and distinguished career, some of his most prominent and groundbreaking cases have included representing those wrongly convicted of Guildford and Birmingham pub bombings, and the families of Stephen Lawrence, the victims of Hillsborough and Grenfell. He also more recently established with his, his wife, Yvette um, Greenway Mansfield, SOS, the charity Silence of Suicide, which works on suicide prevention, intervention and awareness, actively delivering mental health support. So this um, evening's lecture also marks the 10th anniversary of the Community Legal Outreach Collaboration at Kiel Clock. And in the audience today, I want to especially welcome current Community Legal Companions, Clock alumni, and our valued Clock partners. Originally, this lecture was planned within a whole day and evening of events to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Clock. Regrettably, those fuller celebrations have been postponed, not cancelled, but postponed due to a range of factors, including local rail strikes, but principally because the director and founder of CLOCK, Dr Jane Krishnardis, needed unexpectedly to travel to India to be with her husband Krishna. Our thoughts are very much with them and I'm so delighted that Jane is able to join us this evening. So. Before we go on any further, I'd like to just spend a few moments saying something about CLOCK and to pay tribute to the work of Jane and Krishna. The CLOCK was established at Kiel as a response to the significant withdrawal of legal aid under the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act. It is a unique and innovative research led project bringing together universities, law firms, barristers chambers, mediation, charitable and court services to educate, assist, monitor and promote access to justice for disadvantaged communities and especially those that find themselves in court as litigants in person without the support of a solicitor or barrister. But the foundations of CLOCK can be traced back some 30 years to the post earthquake reconstruction process in India and research that involved listening to voices of experience in that time of crisis as they tried to reconstruct their lives and observing the social and legal strategies exemplified by the public interest litigation landmark case filed by Krishna, Krishnadas Sukumaran, a founding member of the Social Legal Information Centre and Human Rights Law Network, in which he was able to challenge and gain a Supreme Court ruling against the state government and World Bank for the reconstruction of those individuals, homes and communities. Drawing upon these strategies, Jane and Krishna returned to the UK and worked to develop academic and also activist community exchanges across Kiel and the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. In 2012, uh, Krishnadas continued his local grassroots community work in Stoke and received a national award for outstanding community engagement from the National Black Police Association. Meanwhile, Jane drew upon these community legal strategies with local women's groups in Stoke 
to develop CLOCK, including working with people at the Citizens Advice Bureau, the YMCA and Domestic and Sexual Abuse Services, New Era and Savannah. Having successfully established CLOCK at Keele, the model has been cascaded nationally, working with universities across the UK to assist over 6,000 people. There is no doubt that such work has an impact on emotional and physical well-being, and the support networks of the social, social justice community are absolutely invaluable. And so we are delighted and honoured that Michael Mansfield Casey is going to talk to us on the theme of Time for Justice to help mark this special occasion and to draw together the related fields of human rights, activism and mental health. I will just mention a few um, housekeeping matters. Um, it's up to you whether you have your cameras on or off. We'd be very happy for you to have your cameras on. So it feels like um, the conversation is with a group of people in the room. Uh, but please do keep your microphones uh, muted. We don't want to hear any uh, sort of hints of strictly in the background. You're welcome to pose comments, but also questions in the chat if you want to use the, uh, the chat function. Um, I've described it as a, as a lecture, but um, in talking um, a few minutes ago, Michael has indicated that he would like to start with some observations, but would be very keen for this to be a much more um, interactive event. So please do put those questions in the chat. I can ask them on your behalf or raise your hand, um, unmute your microphones so that you can um, ask questions directly to Michael and we can have um, fruitful discussions. So with that, I will hand over to you, Michael, to take the floor. Yes, I wish I could take the floor and uh, <laughs> we'd be in person. Um, I, I'm not a great fan of, of, of Zooms, but at least we can come together this way where as we might not have been able to do it at all. So it is better than uh, nothing at all. However, I'm I'm aware of the restrictions, so I, I would be delighted, obviously, if people want to turn their cameras on. Otherwise, I'm talking just to Alison, which is fine. But you know, uh, oh, there we are. They're coming on. Yes, smiling faces. Now, whether you'll stay smiling is another matter, and and I I hope you know that you you will have as many questions as you feel you want to make. Because that's fine by me. But um. Literally within the last five minutes, I've changed the whole thing in my mind as to what I'm going to do, because firstly, my wife, unfortunately, isn't very well today. And without her uh, technique on the on the screen, I don't suppose I'd be appearing at all. I'd just be a skeleton. However, um, she's also a founder member with me of SOS, Silence of Suicide. And I do want to talk about that. And originally we were going to talk together. It was going to be a discussion about the interaction between law and mental health because many of you will realize it was world mental health day only the week before last however as she's not well i will not be switching bits of screen so that i'm pretending to have a discussion and the discussion will be with you um in large measure so that's been changed so it's not a discussion as such but the other thing is the introduction by allison uh, it suddenly got my 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 brain functioning in a different way i just thought well wait a minute Everything you've just said about clock is everything in a way that and, and I didn't appreciate exactly the extent of it uh, that I've been trying to do in another field. Uh, to supplement what I spotted years ago and obviously you spotted years ago, and that is the deficiency in public funding. And of course, that's extremely important if you're going to talk about access to justice. No point in having conventions and rights and, and all the rest if you can't get to the court in the first place because you can't afford to get there. All the risks of costs mounting up are too great. And so it's now, I can't remember the exact year that I, I, I began this. It started not with Keele, it started with Kent University in Canterbury, where 
uh, I help there a bit, but that th they started it off. But I've been to lots of universities talking about what are called critical law groups. Uh, the idea actually stems from Keel, and I'll come back to how it stems from Keel. Uh, the idea originally, so this is probably 30 years ago, just the same as Klopp. The idea was that universities in particular uh, had um, a lot of resources and a lot of ability and could supplement in, in the locality where they were centered. They could help with providing support, providing advice, providing research. And obviously, because of the limitations on qualifications, you can't all walk straight into court. They'd have to be linked to local law firms who would uh, obviously provide the, the specialist advice and possibly the advocacy in court and so on. Now, these sprung up all over the country. And they, it was intended that there would be a strong link between the practitioner and the theorist, the person who's uh, learning in, in a university department. And the, the one of the most successful was set up at Manchester. And the idea was not just to talk about law, was to actually support the community. It, it support it in different ways, not just providing legal advice. So somebody's got a housing problem, somebody's got a mental health problem, whatever it is, you, 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 you do support that. So they're not strictly just dealing with the law, but they're providing a social justice. In other words, support where there often isn't any. Uh, children who've been excluded from school, children who can't read, children who can't write, and students were going out of their way to provide an extracurricular service through the critical law groups in these universities. Now, uh, it's shocking for me to say I've just been reminded of how we started, and I don't know at the moment whether it's flourished. I'm glad that Clock has. It's doing very much the same sort of thing. And the idea also implicit in all this was to get lawyers to think outside the box. Because too many of us are, you, you know, too narrow minded, too blinkered. Uh, I'm not talking, of course, anybody who's attending this meeting tonight. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the people I've had to, to, to live and work with. Uh, and I don't mean any of the contemporary generation. But when I started, uh, there was a very it was a very narrow minded profession. And it, it, it had a sort of implied hostility if you were linked, as I tried to be, with the community in which you lived. Uh, that was going beyond the bounds of professionalism. You are supposed to only represent the person you're with and don't get too involved. You know, it's like a surgeon, one body after another. Well, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't treat whoever's coming through the door as just another body who goes out the other end, fortunately or unfortunately. And um, this approach to the law met with, um, to begin with, incredulity because they thought I was, well, uh, <laughs> I was called the red under the bed in the early days, a phrase that isn't used anymore. Um, I, I wasn't very red and I didn't have a bed. So but anyway, that's what they thought I was. Um, they thought I was I was really angling something towards some sort of armed revolution. Well, I wasn't. So unfortunately, Kiel didn't get the most brilliant name at that point until they realized, actually, the um, the importance of what I was trying to say. And what I was trying to say links to what I did at Keel because um, I won't explain how I got in because you couldn't do it this way anymore. I, I didn't quite just walk through the front gate, but it's very much like that. And a conversation with somebody and the fact that I've been rejected. Let's, let's put it like that. Um, but I wasn't going to I wasn't prepared to put up with that. So I came up and knocked on the admission tutor's door. Mr. Leach, uh, long since gone, lovely man. He was having his lunch at the time and I just said, look, you know, I, why am I not coming here? You know, and he said, well, why are you here? He said, well, I said, well, I want you, uh, I want something done about it. Uh, and over a, um, a, an angel delight, uh, uh, I think it was butterscotch in those days, over an angel delight, you know, he said, well, I can't believe you've come up here to do this. But this is important because it is about, you know, um, being persistent and having a belief in yourself and what you want to do. And thanks to Keel, they reacted to this and said, yeah, he, he said, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to interview you now. I don't I don't understand why you've got in and your friend. I had a friend who he got in. He had the same results. And I said, you know, it doesn't seem fair to me. 
I mean, can you believe that happening now? My God, you have to go through paperwork up to your eyeballs. Uh, you, you can't do this. And he, he asked one question and he said, all right, the, the, this is the question. If I gave you a million pounds, sounds like the Tarrant show, you know, if I give you a million pounds, what would you do with it? And I, I didn't take long to answer it, <laughs> to, which is, to his surprise, because he told me afterwards, he said, we nearly spluttered over the Gooseberry Fool. You answered it straight away. And in, in a really rather extraordinary, I said, yeah, I know what I do. Uh, I said, I'd be out this door. I get half of it to my mother who had very little, and my father had died uh, two years before, so in a bad way. And I said, I give it all to her. She's never had proper holidays. She has, she's not living in good conditions. I give it to her. And the other half, she, I said, I ha I've hardly been outside the, the shores of the United Kingdom. So um, I'm not going to come here. I wouldn't come to Kiel. I wouldn't bother with the university. I would go around the world. I'd go around and visit everywhere I've never been. And so he just looked at me and he said, you're in. And I said, oh, right. Well, thank you very much. And he said, what's that bag over there? And he said, well, I said, well, that's all my things. I brought them with me because I thought if you said yes, I better start tomorrow because the term's the next day. And from that moment onwards, I just felt Kiel had something special. They were prepared to open their doors. They had an approach which I don't suppose any other university in the world at that point would have allowed, you know, a sort of rather bedraggled young, well, I, you know, teenager to sort of walk through the door like that. And what Kiel, once at Kiel, there was this liberal arts aspect of Kiel, which seems to have been forgotten, particularly by a certain graduate who's been home secretary recently but isn't anymore um you know that the, the liberal arts really matter we're not all woke arati you know thank you crew oh, i mustn't say cruella Bru suela braverman you know and her attitude to those of us who read the guardian and eat tofu um it, 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 but the whole point of the liberal arts course was to get you thinking well, I thought it was anyway, because I'd never thought that the foundation year where you went from astronomy through to zoology and you got a taste of everything through the weeks that went by. Now, I don't think they do that anymore. I'm fairly sure you don't get that anymore. Uh, I fought a long battle with the Robbins Committee, who were uh, responsible for uh, partly for make, making sure the kill sort of kept to the rails and did traditional uh, degrees. But the point about the foundation year was I came in touch with things I'd never even dreamt of, thought about, done anything. We all did. We all did. And a vast majority after the foundation year changed from the subjects they thought they were going to do to the subjects they did. Because, again, it got you thinking. And in my case, it was coming across philosophy because um, I, I certainly had not done it at school. I didn't know much about it, but it sounded pretty interesting. And there was a certain professor then who, to whom I, ha I owe a great debt, Professor Flew. And in the end, he came on to a radio program I was doing called The Moral Maze. And I had the opportunity to cross-examine him about his beliefs rather than the other way around. So, but he was the one, he was the one, along with a lot of other staff at the time, who actually forced me to start using my brain. Because up to that point, I, I had been programmed through the schools and so on that I've been to, to fit into a certain framework set by the universities. Whereas the, the, the foundation had caused me to think about actually stepping outside that, stepping outside the box. What I call lateral thinking. Now, lateral thinking is still not, well, it may be at Keel, but it's, it's still something I'm very keen on as a subject. And it links into the way I've approached uh, the, the law. Uh, and lateral thinking was very much part of the philosophy course that I did, which included um, moral philosophy as well as empirical philosophy, empiricists in particular. Uh, uh, Professor Flew was particularly interested in that aspect of it, which was language, linguistics and so on. So that grounding when I left university to go to qualify for the bar because they didn't do law at Keel, and even if they, they they do now but they didn't then even if they had have done law i wouldn't have done law because law in as, as a subject doesn't cause you to do that unless it's jurisprudence so law is a subject i wouldn't have done and i i don't encourage people to do law as a degree you probably hate me for saying this but actually i think you know before you ever get to practice law you really have to 
do what I was going to do if he'd given me. And I said after he said, <laughs> he said, you're in. I said, so where's the money? Um, um, you know, I, w- I would have he, he, he used it to, to establish in universities. And I'm trying to do that at the moment, um, mainly with Cambridge University, um, <clears throat> a sort of podcast in which we talk about lateral thinking, about approaching a subject from a different dimension. It may be a different discipline. So you pre- approach a legal problem, not as a lawyer, but as a person who perhaps knows about the law, but is also conscious of, of the consequences for the people who are out there. Now, this is important at the moment because I don't want to spend tonight talking to all of you, knowing that, you know, be, beyond the shores of the university and the campus, beyond where we're all living, as uh, the, the the clock project was established during a time of crisis, th- there's no other word from the, the, the situation we're now in. It is now a crisis situation. It's not a crisis of the kind of which, which we all have to tear our hair out, but we all have to recognise the, and this is what a uh, government has not done. I don't care what complexion it is. The politicians are out of touch all the time and it ha- happened within the law. So the lawyers are ha- have a role to play here to ensure that the public are connected to what is going on. And so just to give you an example, what I found particularly disgraceful <clears throat> over the last few years, it's happened before, but it's particularly disgraceful. Uh, <clears throat> when you think about what's happening this weekend, they're actually wanting, somebody's actually thinking that Boris should come back. Unbelievable, in my view. Unbelievable that anybody should even think about inviting him back. He led a government, if that's what you can call it, he led a government which included Pretty Patel as Home Secretary, which included Suella Braverman as the Attorney General, that in my view was illegal. It was a government that had no respect. Now, you know, never mind all the other crises that have come since. I'll, I'll come to those. The fact is, you look back retrospectively, which is why it's appalling that they should be considering him or anybody who was a member of that government. Uh, at the moment, it seems like, you know, the Titanic analogy that's often made, you know, it's going down and all they're doing is rearranging the deck chairs at the moment. That's all that's happening. We're not getting any real new talent involved in it. Just for a moment, the things that Johnson did that makes me angry as a lawyer and as as wanting social justice, the time for justice, social justice. I mean, if you think also, I mean, come back to Boris in a minute. This summer, we're in the middle of having had COVID, energy crisis, cost of living crisis, Ukraine war, you name it, environmental, you know, destruction on a major scale. And what do we get? We get a prime minister who comes in, as Adam Smith said, as those of you who've done the you know, philosophy will remember, he's not exactly left wing. Adam Smith Institute and, and, and so forth. But Adam Smith was saying that British have a propensity for worshipping the wealthy and neglecting the poor. And that is exactly what she did. How on earth? Even Biden spotted it while he was having an ice cream. What on earth are they doing? Uh, in other words, favouring basically the wealthy and the tax cuts. It's a disgrace in the middle of this. You think they'd connected. This is where the lateral thinking comes in. They're just not on the same planet. And and so this this is a situation which goes back to Boris Johnson and before. But his his attitude to the rule of law, we tend to forget. He, He prorogued parliament. We don't have too many democratic institutions and parliament probably isn't one of them at the way it operates but it, in fact he tried to prorogue it yes it took um it took the supreme court to actually revert you know to actually put it you know firmly in place that what he was trying to do was undemocratic and unlawful but it doesn't make any difference he went on to you know he's not interested in conventions and treaties the northern ireland protocol no torn it up because there's an arrogance, because there's a belief that they can do what they want, because they've got a majority, a democratic majority, it 
it provides as Hailsham, who was Lord Chancellor some years ago, as you may remember, he actually described the British way of government as effectively an elected totalitarian dictatorship. And he was right. I didn't agree with much, he said, but I did agree with that because that's what we're looking at here. And so he tears up the protocol. And then what do we get? We get, you know, they try to slough it off. Oh, well, he had a birthday cake and a few drinks. What? They set the rest of the population. Thousands of people died. We're dealing with a situation in which it actually is so serious that people obviously were in lockdown and all the rest of it. Meanwhile, in Whitehall, Dominic Cummings, do I need to rattle off all the names? So I'm saying all of this because basically we've got government that is not democratic. There's there's a democratic deficit, a democratic bankruptcy here because there's no respect, bottom line, for the law. There's no respect for the rule of law. And Partygate is an absolute perfect example of the fact they just think they can do it and slough it off. And that doesn't even touch all the people who've had to leave office during his, they're not all not all his responsibility, uh, during um, uh, the, the last five years. A large number of have had to leave because of inappropriate, to say the least of it, uh, sexual advances, advances and, and sexual misbehaviour, one after the other. And then underneath all that, there is corruption. Underneath all that, we have the procurement thing during COVID, whereby you know, the Tories are, are, are feathering their own nest all the way through. And the courts held that they, they were doing it unlawfully. Now, that's the type of thing that's been happening at one level. And you may say, well, Yes. So so what do we do? Well, I think I've been saying for some time, we don't have to put up with it and people don't put up with it. And that's why the clock, in a sense, is part of that initiative. And many of the cases that I've been involved in, uh, the, 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 the difference and the change comes from the force of the people you represent who realise that the people in Whitehall really don't understand and they are disconnected and that the only way you shame people into action and I can reel the cases off so I don't have to go into detail but you can ask more whether it's um, you know Stephen Lawrence and his parents whether it's the families of the Marchioness whether it's um, the Bloody Sunday families Hillsborough right through to Grenfell now in each case and the Kent babies this last week in each case, it's because the families, the victims, the people who understand and are connected about the inequalities and, and the injustice that is being happened, they're not prepared to put up with it. And they know that, you know, unless they push hard, the authorities are not going to do anything unless they make it so difficult, so uncomfortable that, in fact, in the end, it's slow, but it happens very slowly and it's very effective. And so I, in all of the examples I've just given you, I mean, Lawrence is probably the, the best known one, although they're all quite well known. Uh, and you say, well, how did it change? It changed in this way that Doreen and Neville both said at the end of the inquiry, which uh, came out with a, a lot of uh, set about 70 recommendations for change. And they said, well, we're not going to wait for the government to do this. That, that they, they will probably stick it on a shelf somewhere and it'll be on a back burner and it won't happen. But they said, no, we're going we're, we're, we're to get involved. And they got involved by every year. They didn't do it anymore, but they were doing it. Then it was every other year. They hired the Central Hall Westminster and they said, right, we want the ministers, the head of police. And they've got to come here and tell us what, what recommendations they've actually managed to implement. And it was kind of a moral shame, an exercise in which people were bursting to get there. The Home Secretaries wanted to get there and speak. And so did the head of police and so on, because they wanted to in some cases, pretend that they've actually implemented them, but it, lest it kept them up to the mark. And in each case, it's the it's the families who've had that impetus. And in a sense, that's what you're doing through the, the clock initiative and the critical law groups. We're getting local people to realise that taking action and taking people to court, even though it's difficult. So, for example, the government is very anxious to ensure you don't have that right. So what they're doing on judicial review, you may be aware of it, you may not. They've, th there's been huge cuts on legal aid. You mentioned them a moment ago as being the reason. Huge cuts on legal aid. 
And the, those cuts affect the public. And of course, on judicial review, forget it. So what you have to do now in order to mount a challenge is obviously crowdfund. And there are sites where you can do that, but it's a huge risk in order to raise the money to challenge government when there's a lack of due process and so on. Uh, and I'm involved in a number of cases challenging government over due process in relation to big issues um, uh, where they undoubtedly will feel under pressure because that's happening and there's publicity that's associated with it. But for the average person, there's got to be collectivity. They can't do it on their own. They've got to feel that there's, um, uh, as it were, a solid group of people around who are going to support them. Now, that's extremely important because it, this is where it touches on mental health. Because the stresses of what is going on at the moment in the world outside is huge for most people worrying about not a tax cut that might uh, trickle down you know, in 20 years time. What they're worried about is what's going to happen next week. It's that imminent. They haven't got the money, you know, heat or eat. You, well, I'm sure you're all familiar, particularly students and the generation, which, as far as I'm concerned, you know, my future's tied up, what, what's left of it anyway. Um, you know, my future's tied up and everybody's future's tied up with the generation that are coming through university at the moment and the predicament that they're all in at the moment, which is not being properly addressed. And therefore, these initiatives of which the clock is one and the critical law groups is another but there is another movement which i want to just talk about and touch on before i get to, to sos which i've helped to, to create within the united kingdom but also outside the Un united kingdom you may not know much about it but uh, i'd like the university to think about this possibility and that is the establishment of tribunals of inquiry not not set up by government because government inquiries take too long they're too expensive on the whole they obviously do achieve an element of truth because they're very thorough and and uh, witnesses have to come and give evidence and so they have a role to play obviously but for many families who have been shortchanged by the system uh, there is another way, uh, but it's not easy, of beginning to challenge what's going on, and that is to set up citizens' commissions of inquiry. Now, the original idea for this came from Bertrand Russell, another philosopher who you may be very familiar with. And he, he felt that there should be uh, tribunals of conscience, whereby... A government, it could be a national government or it could be international institutions are circumventing conventions and are not applying human rights. And remember, it was this last government who wanted to do away with the Human Rights Act and start all over again. I mean, I don't know what human rights they're talking about, but, you know, basically we're in a situation there where they were even trying to do that. And this week, this week. I hope you've all been following what's going on in the House of Commons as far as you can. Never mind who's, who's going to step into the main seat. But actually, there's, a, there's legislation going through that is draconian. And that's they've, they've renamed it because if they don't get it through the first time, they change the name, hoping that nobody will spot that it's the same elephant going through the chamber. And what they're dealing with, what I'm dealing with here is uh, public order. Last year, they were defeated in the House of Lords over the police bill, which is bringing in huge, huge uh, constraints on protest, which <clears throat> the people we're dealing with here, the protesters, are described in really offensive terms, not only by the ex-Home Secretary, as well as lawyers. People like me are also cast in the same mould, I've no doubt at all. Uh, and um, uh, Suella Braverman also. It, 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 calling protesters basically you know criminals vagabonds and so on really observations that are out of place in in my view entirely out of place so what do they want to do they basically want to curb pr peaceful protest i know they dress it up as oh well there are extremes we're going to stop people gluing themselves to trains where and you're going to be it's going to be an offense if you'll be caught in public carrying a lock with you and the original bill, if you shouted too loud on a demonstration, 
that too was going to be made illegal. And what they've done is they brought in, in this bill, have a look at it, it's gone through the third reading, it got passed. They can tag protesters so they see where you are in your home, even if you've actually not been on the protest yet, if they think you're going. And the Home Secretary, this is the last thing she managed to do before she walked off the stage for the moment, and, and that was um, to, to allow the Home Secretary of the day to have enforcement orders so that people are banned from going to some demonstrations, people are banned from some activities, banned from even associating with certain named people. That's how bad it is. And this this has gone through with, because there's so much else going on, it gets overlooked. And it's on the way to be obviously on the statute books before long. And this is this is all aimed at a situation in which access to the courts is restricted by funding. Access to the courts is restricted in the sense of JRs are made as difficult as possible. And legal aid for criminal work well, you've seen something, probably you may have noticed it over the last year, unknown at the bar. When I first joined, the idea that you go on strike, you know, uh, I, I'm, I did mention industrial action about 15, 20 years ago, and they all, I think I was hounded out of the room. It, that idea that the bar would come out as it has done, and the bar, and if it isn't really about the lawyers because they want to do a job for the public, but basically they can't survive. I don't mean, you know, people of my seniority, I mean the middle to junior bar, even the deal they've got, and I'm speaking to them regularly, they can't survive because the uplift, the 15% or whatever it is, does not equate with the cost of living rise that's happened over the last five years. So they're in deep trouble and they are leaving the bar. They're having to get other jobs. Now, that's how bad it is. And that's why these situations have to be I think my wife is passing me a note, like um, probably, uh, oh yes, sorry, yes. Thank you, Yvette, thank you. Come on, you should come and join me. Um, yes, she's quite right, as always. I'll come back to that. Um, so so I think the, the exigency we're facing at the moment is critical, and there has to be collective action of the kind I've described. Now, the People's Commission's of, of tribunals that have been set up. They're called different things in different places. I've done probably more than anybody else in the United Kingdom, but I've also done them abroad. There was a Russell Tribunal on Palestine, which I did over the course of four years. I did another one connected with Iran. I've done uh, several related to Ireland and Irish politics uh, and a lot to do with the National Health Service in, in uh, this country. And we did one, the, the People's COVID Inquiry. Now, I don't know who knows about that, but please look it up. We we did the we did a whole inquiry last year and came up with a report called Misconduct in Public Office aimed at, uh, at Boris and others uh, for, for the iniquities that they performed themselves. So that's that that report is available. But we did it in four months, the whole thing. Now, of course, it's not as thorough, it's not as deep rooted as a public judicial inquiry, which is going to take, first of all, Boris didn't want one. Then eventually when he was shamed into having one, it still hasn't really started. And the evidence isn't happening till next year. So imagine uh, how long it'll be before the actual reports coming out uh, and the recommendations. It'll be too late, we'll be into the next pandemic. So that's why a, a people's tribunal, it was funded by ordinary members of the NHS as well as the public to hold this inquiry. I was the chair of a panel of judges, very illustrious, who listened to people who'd suffered from COVID uh, and also the lack of preparation, all the issues that you're familiar with, uh, and obviously the horrendous uh, care home situation, which was uh, right at the beginning. And a lot of other issues, but we dealt with all those quickly, and that's what the People's Commission were doing. So there are lots of things that lawyers can, people who are lawyers or are interested in the law, can do to make a difference uh, to, to the social justice, is what I call it. It's time for social justice, no question, it's well overdue. And um, SOS, in a way, is performing part of that part of that role because. We, we set it up because Yvette, my wife, lost a close friend to suicide and I lost my daughter to suicide. And uh, at the at the 
at the funeral uh, and afterwards um, I, there was a gathering of all the people who knew my daughter. I gave us a, a short speech, uh, although looking at tonight, probably you're thinking, God, you can't possibly give a short speech, can you? Um, anyway, but I did a short speech. And I, what I wanted to say to everybody was thank you for coming. But and then I talked about suicide. And it was uh, uh, quite stunning because after I finished, I, I was surrounded by, well, I can't say hundreds, but tens of people saying, you use that word. And I said, yeah, I did. What's wrong with that? And of course, I hadn't I hadn't appreciated that for many people, for actually the majority, that there is a taboo that is a, a stigma attached to the use of the word. Because, of course, as a lawyer, I should have realized when I first started practicing, suicide was a crime. And it still is a crime if you assist suicide. So they just said, you know, can you do something about it? And so I thought, well, no, I can't do it. You know, again, I can't do it on my own. But collectively, we can begin a process which others are doing as well is to decriminalize the idea of suicide. And, and, and you know, instead of there's this whole movement to criminalize protest, it should be decriminalized. And so should so should the concept of suicide. So we began by holding meetings throughout the whole of the United Kingdom, wherever we could get at that point. Um, in order to get people to, to to communicate, to talk about it to each other. Now, I don't know whether Kiel, I, I know I've been to Kiel before and we've talked about this, but I, I would like to think that there would be a space at Kiel where people who, and there must be loads of people who are right on the edge at this moment and probably don't have anybody to talk to. And it doesn't necessarily, I'm not talking about having a moral tutor or having somebody, a member of staff, because However good they are, at the end of the day, I personally feel it's it's the people you you actually live alongside. They're often the best people to talk to if you can get them to understand what you're talking about. That's what we were trying to do is to get citizens to come together without any reprobation, without any pejorative view about suicide in order to talk to each other. And what we did is to bring together in one room people who have attempted suicide and people who suffered from the results because um, because they uh, they they've lost their loved ones. Now that's quite a thing to put them in the same room because there's a lot of um, that, that there's a lot of worry and concern about, about all of that uh, putting the two groups in the same room. But it works brilliantly because once one group listens to the other group, they begin to realise what the pressures are. And it produces a dialogue of the kind I've not seen before. But we had to stop it once we got to COVID because we couldn't get out and about. And we're only now beginning to, to, to set this up. And when we go to in institutions like universities, I always say, look, have you got a space somewhere that's safe where people can go? That, that it's not a suicide room, it, because now we're dealing with stress. Stress is the biggest factor in all of this. Uh, and, and lies behind the social justice inequalities. And so it's getting people to offload and share the burden. And then out of that comes uh, a sort of willingness and, an, and um, an inspiration and an energy to bring about change in whatever field it is that is particularly affecting you. Uh, and we we then because we couldn't go and do it in places at the advent of covid uh, Yvette almost single-handedly set up a hotline so instead of doing it as a group basis individual callers were asked to uh, were invited and encouraged to ring up and talk to a whole bank of volunteers that Yvette has brought together and it's taken off in an amazing way such that we can't cope we haven't got enough resources to answer the phone and we haven't got a, you know, enough money to employ lots of people either. But it's there's a big need for a situation in which people feel able to speak about things that are relatively unspeakable or have been. But nowadays, of course, the problems have grown. Oh, Yvette's coming in. Oh, good. Oh, um, I think she feels I've said enough about the law. Now, that, give me one minute while I see what she wrote here. Every oh, you say it, you say it, you say it. 
Welcome to Yvette. Yes. <laughs> A miraculous everyone. recovery. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Well, actually, I'm doing this for Jane o'clock um, because she was very keen that I do. And she is one of the most wonderful, wonderful people that I've ever met. Um, she does so much. She's so unselfish. And yes, I don't feel great. And I do apologise for joining late, but actually she'd do it for me. So the least I can do is do it for her. So um, apologies for coming in so late, but I think Michael's spoken to you all really brilliantly so far about so many things. And I'm sure you've you've enjoyed it. I'm not going to say a lot, but I just oh, no, want... go on, go on, say a lot. <laughs> what I did want to do was look at the cross the crossovers of access between justice. And what does justice mean in this situation? Because justice can mean lots of different things to yeah. me anyway. Now, for example, on our phone lines, which are now open seven nights a week, I have lost count of the number of people that phone in because they don't have access to um, mental health care or continuity of mental health care, consistency of mental health care. If they've got to appear in court, they have no support whatsoever. And these are people that really do not have a clue what is going on. They're frightened, they're confused, they don't know how systems work, and yet there is nothing there for them. Now, that to me is an injustice, <laughs> that people are not afforded just the basic levels of support that they need as a bare minimum. And you know, how is this happening? It really upsets me that this is happening to so many people. We have people on the phone crying, literally crying, saying they just do know not what they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know who to turn to. They don't know if there is anyone to turn to. And what is more frightening is the people they thought they could turn to that would help them turn out to be the people that actually have failed them. And the system is a mess. I think there's no doubt about it. I think obviously mental health is definitely underfunded, but I do think that's only part of the problem. I hear some quite terrible stories about the quality of care. And I'm not here to blame anyone for the job that they are trying to do. There are great people within the NHS and within um, private practice who are doing their best to help people and deliver the best quality of care that they can. But there is no doubt that some people are in the wrong jobs. <laughs> okay? There is no doubt about it from the stories I hear. And of course, I'm hearing it third party. So what do I know at the end of the day? I am hearing what I'm told. It may be correct. It may not be. But I hear too much of it for not th there not to be something in these people's words. It's consistent all the time. I've been on a waiting list for 18 months, nobody cares. Or my friend was on a, a, list, a waiting list for 18 months. At the end of that, it was too late. They'd already decided to end their lives. They couldn't wait any longer. Yeah, and, and it's the same, whichever level of care you look at, primary care with the GPs, who have got a lot better, but again, their time is limited. They're overwhelmed. They don't really have the time to sit down and talk to people in the way that is needed when we're discussing mental health. You can't just discuss that in a five minute appointment sort. I'm sorry, you just cannot. Anybody who believes that is the case is completely living on the moon. They're on another planet. So the point I made to, to, to Michael early on was this, is that every night we hear from people in unjust situations with unjustified struggles and with no justice available to them. And that was really how I wanted to round it up in terms of mental health, because when you look at it, it is completely unjust. The system is not working for people. Therefore, it is unjust for the people that rightly need and deserve our support. And the charitable sector, uh, organisations such as CLOCK, you know, there's loads of brilliant organisations. If it wasn't for these people and these organisations, I, I truly believe suicide rates would be a lot higher than they are. The onus is on these people who are doing it out of the goodness of their heart, simply the kindness of spirit, the depth of love they have for other people and wanting to do something good. Those are the people that are saving lives right now. And I say that is not a, crit a criticism of the system at all. There are loads of good people within those systems. They're either not funded or they're not perhaps in the right role for them. Um, but yeah, it's it's all very, very distressing. But I do believe there's hope. 
I do. There has to be hope. And I think that's what we have to give out to people, because for all of us that are here supporting somebody else, that's hope. That really helps people. And that's important. Domestic abuse. Yeah, I'm reading. Things. Domestic abuse is not. I'm just going to read a couple of messages, if that's OK. Domestic abuse is not at all taken seriously. If no serious bruise. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, uh, domestic abuse, whether it's whether it's um, uh, experienced by male or female, OK, doesn't really matter. It, it exists. OK, um, it is nasty. And I think this coercive control, uh, when I heard that being brought into part of the domestic abuse law, I kind of laughed because I thought, you know, that is almost unprovable. How do people prove that they're victims of uh, coercive control? In a way, it, it, it's not anything that you can be done. And I absolutely agree with you. I've been there myself, right? And if you don't have the physical marks to prove it, you are, let's just say people are sceptical, OK? They're sceptical about you, whether you're a male or a female. They're not too sure whether to believe you or not. And straight away, that is unjust to gain. The strain and the stress it puts on individuals to know, A, that they're not believed, and B, that they've got to sit there and try and prove, prove their truth. Uh, to, to authorities is absolutely disgusting at a time when they're struggling and under severe stress. And we wonder why people's mental health goes downhill. We wonder, yeah, because people are not treated as individuals. Their stories are not heard individually. We're all lumped into kind of like a pack, OK? And well, this is what it's usually like, uh, rather than treating people individually. And it's so wrong. Um, well, there's an interesting one here about uh, Bristol University. We're very familiar with this because yeah. uh, I don't know how many years ago it was now, maybe three, possibly four. We were aware that Bristol had um, uh, not just a reputation, but in fact, uh, a series of cases arising there. And so we offered assistance we, and they took a year to consider what we might do. And then they turned us down. They're mm -hmm. the only ones who have done that. Mm -hmm. And part of the thinking in Bristol was that essentially, firstly, they don't want to admit it's happening because they think it is a reflection on the university. And secondly, they think they can do it in other ways that uh, look more professional. In other words, bringing in psychiatrists and so on, which, of course, that's part of the equation. What they don't understand is the preemptive situation which we're addressing before it ever gets to that. Yeah. And, and, and they didn't recognise it and they weren't prepared to, as it were. And I think that it that is so important, Michael, and for everybody here, you know, it's a bit like shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted. Why we're leaving it so late when actually we can address it in good time? It's just by sitting down and talking about it, addressing it, and treat, treating it as the societal issue that it is. All right, and giving it the due attention it deserves. We can actually start implementing preventative. Um, pathways rather than waiting until it's almost too mm. late and then we have this great big crisis on our hands. I'd just like to address one other question from Rosie Monkman and, and thank you all of you for your questions. Um, how does our hotline differ from the Samaritans? Okay so our hotline how does it differ? D differ? Okay first of all um, our volunteers are trained to have active engagement with our callers. So whereas the Samaritans, I think, would freely identify themselves as a listening service, and it is a great service, there's lots of people rely on, um, we are much more engaging than that. OK, so, um, for example, I, I've, I've, I've had people phone us up who said, you know, I, I don't just want to be listened to. I, I need to hear a voice coming back at me. I need to feel there's a human there. Yeah. And I think that's where our service mainly differs, um, because we, we do engage with people. We do ask them questions. We do encourage them to dig deep in there so that they realise what they're about, where they're at and how perhaps by helping them, by supporting them, we can help them to move forwards and get out of the current mindset. We're not making out at all that we can solve problems. <laughs> How can you sort if somebody hasn't got money, they haven't got money, OK? But there might be things they haven't thought of, like checking their benefits, what benefits they can access, um, you know, speaking to family and friends that maybe can help them out, you know, just approaching people and speaking to them, not being afraid about communicating when they have got problems. And that's usually the very first step. So I think that is the main difference between us if if that if that helps rosie thank you um what would a wise philosopher prescribe for our broken society big question i know oh well absolutely and i'm bought <laughs> i'm gonna bottle this one i'm gonna pass it over to my no something i <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> well, I think there's got to there's certainly got to be a a sea change in the, the the mental parameters within which we work and the responsibility and accountability and so on. Sometimes it's called the duty of candor. I mean, there is no duty of candor in the democracy we've got, the so-called democracy that we're in. Mm -hmm. So w some of us are struggling to get that. The fact that we have to argue its presence on a statute is ridiculous. It, you'd think it was an integral part of, of government, but it's not there. So there's no, there's, there isn't a duty of candor yet. We're trying to, it's called Hillsborough Law is what we're trying trying to do. But that this is to do with attitude and frame of mind. You have to have a, a mental attitude. And at the moment, what worries me, worries everybody, is that the political classes are turning around in small circles and disappearing as they do it. And, and their thinking is is not engaged, but it is engaged with one thing, namely the accumulation, acquisition and retention of power. That's it. That's all they're talking about now. Who's going to get us through the next election? What about the rest of us? You know, what about the rest of us? So there's got to be some serious um, uh, changes of attitude and mood. And that can only be brought about by people coming together at universities and elsewhere uh, and bringing about sea change because they mean business and, and government sees they do mean business and they think, oh, my God, we might lose the election. So th that's um, one thing. And I was just going to mention that I don't know whether you're all steeped in A.D. Lindsay. Uh, well, you should be if you're not. But anyway, I gather there's a, a unit somewhere in the university with all the Lindsay papers all lined up. Uh, I, I, I'd never heard of Lindsay, to be honest, when I came up to Kiel. As you know, my entrance was rather unconventional. Um, but I learned about him as I was there. And I thought, amazing man. Uh, he wrote The Democratic State, The Modern Democratic State. Unfortunately, I didn't realise until last night it was only volume one. He never got to volume two. And I think, in fact, had he been given the opportunity to write more in the way that he was, he might have constructed a different kind of a democratic state to the one that we've got at the moment. But I do think it requires, as I say, it, it, you know, I, I look at it from the roots rather than from above. It's we have to do, we have to make the change. I think it was Mahatma Gandhi. We are the change we desire. We are the change we desire. I'm not going to give it to anybody else, you know, in an election because I don't trust them longer than they walk down the front path as to what they're going to do with it. And we need if we're going to have democracy, this is just an issue which I started to kill this particular debate. What kind of democracy do you want? Well, I, I'd like the, you can't have the Greek city state, but you can have something close to that. You have mandated politicians. You don't have representative politicians. You have politicians that have a social contract. So you don't have a party deciding who's going to be the next prime minister with 100,000 people in Surrey deciding that, or even the MPs. The contract is with us, not with them. And that's why I think a mandated democracy, which is just one aspect, it's been discussed many times, and politicians reject it because they realise that if they break the mandate, they're out. And the, and, the, and the constituencies have the right to kick them out. And, 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 and these are all provisions for a very different setup and proportional representation. There are lots of, you know, lots of uh, measures that have to be combined to bring about the change. But the first change is up here, you know, it's the mental change and mental attitude to, you know, ordinary people and their lives. Yeah, because I think the problem is, uh, I don't know if anybody else thinks this, I think for the average person now, the situation that people are finding themselves in financially, in relation to, you know, that affects everything, their homes, their work, it, you know, their children, it affects everything. It's like... Are, do they have the energy to drive change themselves, Michael? This is the problem. I don't know that people do well, anymore. They're so concerned about just existing, it, yeah. not, not even living, just existing from yeah. day to day. Where do they find that energy? Uh, where are they? Where does that energy get, become galvanized? Well, okay. Um, sorry, if, if we're talking too much, then just shut us up. Any <laughs> because you know we've got, uh, we've got somebody with a hand up, Michael. We've got Mark asking, wanting to ask uh, okay. a question. Oh, Mark. Okay, I'll, I'll just. Um, In a moment. I've got to deal with this. It's a very good point that Yvette makes, and I'm very conscious of the fact, and I always think about the single parent, you know, with two kids, a dog and a parrot living in one room in a tower block. I'm often thinking about how on earth do they get up in the morning and they they haven't got enough money to survive. So, you know, getting them interested in, and, and this is why I think it's important. 
my experience over the years, I, I go back to let's take the Birmingham Six, one of the earliest ones. There was a situation in which they felt there was no hope. They'd given up. Well, a lot of people had given up, except the six themselves had not given up. Their families had not given up and they had little or no resources. Nobody wanted to listen to them because they were, you know, Irish and all that, all, all the prejudices, you know. So where did their energies come from? This is your question, really. And I, I, I was staggered by the fact that even with little or no resources, you know, spiritually and economically, it was the need, it was the desire to bring about change. In that case, it was obviously mm -hmm. the prison sentences. And, and they succeeded where nobody, and it's the same with the Hillsborough families. It's the same with the Grenfell families. It's because they won't give up because they government wants you to give up. But at the end of the day, I think we all have a reserve within us where you get to a point, a line in the sand and you say, I'm not taking any more of this. Now, I'm not talking about armed revolution. I'm talking about mental revolution, that people come together and decide you can do it together. You can't do it on your own, but you can do it together. So I, I'm amazed by the human spirit. That's that's where I think it comes from at the end of the day. I'm not trying to be too idealistic, but Mark's got his hand up, is he? Mm -hmm. OK, let's go for it. Hi, uh, Michael. Good to talk. Um, a, bit, a, bit, a bit of an interesting one. So. Is there a degree of, do you think, cognitive dissonance in, the, in terms of what we're sort of dealing with at the moment? Because obviously I've done clock myself. I then did clock in Liverpool um, when I was doing my master's and I now um, work in a sort of chancery firm where you don't really deal with people. Um, and for me, clock really idealises your ability to sort of ground yourself as a person and really deal with real people, which is what the law is at the end of the day. And I wondered whether... It, in terms of what we're dealing with at the moment, where people they're, they're so beaten down by the legal system and the lack of legal aid, and um, I saw it, you know, people they they come in just expecting nothing, and even when they get like a slither of help from Clock or whoever, it's it's it's, it's amazing. And I, and I wondered, well, it's a bit of a, a loaded question, not so much how we got here because I think we've sort of covered that, but how do we get out of this hole? How do we get out of this just mess that we've sort of created where people's expectations are so low? Um, well, I, th I think, yeah, it's a good point. And, and obviously it bothers all of us all the time. But I think, that, I mean, you're probably going to compare me to John Clues in a shoebox. You know, that famous story about, you know, when I was a boy, we lived in a shoebox. Yeah, OK, it's a bit like that. But I'm thinking back, you know, I'm getting on, as you probably are aware. But uh, those of you who feel how are we going to get out of this hole? I don't know whether you can get hold of it, but it's worth watching Clement Attlee in 1946. We'd been through a horrendous war. We'd had the hell bo bombed out of us, in, you know, and, and obviously I remember a little bit about it. And yet we had very little. We're on rationing austerity. Now, I'm not wanting to do the John Cleese thing. I'm just wanting to say that was a pretty low period. Um, Churchill, much to his amazement, didn't get voted in and he didn't get voted in because people wanted a vision they wanted to see there must be another way of living internationally as far as human rights is concerned of course that led to all sorts of initiatives with the united nations and with the european convention as well in the wake of that and of course Attlee did this speech it's in the central hall westminster it's an absolutely brilliant speech about uh, the return of the soldier and all the rest of it and providing um, basically a welfare state, which is now frowned on. It's almost a word of abuse. You know, you're seen as a, as a, as a wokey if you even talk about it. But that's what he was talking about. He was capturing people's imagination by the, and saying, we can do it. We can change it. And he did do it. Well, not on his own. But he created a, a, a different, the remnants of that society are still the bits that keep us together. But that's what he had. And I think that's what's required. Now, somebody wrote, I, I just caught, my eye caught it before we started, that there's a letter in The Guardian, <clears throat> not that that's the font of all wisdom, but there was a letter in The Guardian saying, you know, perhaps Corbynism had something about it. Well, I think perhaps it did. It wasn't so much Jeremy himself, but I think some of the ideas he had did have an element of vision, which was obviously uh, slashed to pieces by others who felt there's something more immediate. So you've got, you've got to make 
because the Red Wall constituencies, in other words, rejected it all. However, you, you know, the, 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 what, a, what Attlee did was to bring it home to people in a real way that was manageable and achievable. And that's what that's what's got to happen. And we don't have anybody in the political classes at the moment to do that. And obviously, philosophy departments at universities and so on. I looked up some of the debates about A.D. Lindsay and, and, and they go off on one. They talk about Hegel and all the rest of it. Well, you know, the average person living in, uh, wherever they are are not going to be that interested in the offshoot debates that come out of Lindsay. But I think there is that's the vacuum. There's a moral and intellectual vacuum at the moment in which that sort of there are groups that come together. Uh, that to talk about it but of course they don't get the support or or or, or the exposure uh, and it's very very difficult because we've got a a media that is um, itself you know governed by one or two people and you know they're either on the left or the right or whatever mostly mostly it's a very right wing press so the chances of getting ideas explored in that way are very small so at the end of the day it it is down to some lo local groups I know it's, it's painstaking to do it this way, but th this has been my conclusion is local groups, local initiatives, family groups coming together and staying together and bringing about change on your doorstep. Then people start to wake up and say, right, this is working and we can make something more of it. And then they connect to another group. And it's about showing the initiative, having the courage. And actually, what also impresses me is that when, uh, for example, in legal cases where we have a particularly good cause and we think, you know, it, it's got to be litigated and you go public with it, the public are very good. They do raise money when they think there's a cause that is worth supporting. They will do it. So I think we, you know, we have to have faith in the communities in which we live. You know, it's not it's not a complete jungle. At least I don't think it is anyway. I'm just wondering whether it's possible to bring Jane in. Um, Jane has put a question in the chat, but I it would be lovely. Oh, I'm trying to see where is the question from Jane. A little way up, but Jane, have you? Is Jane still with us? Has she oh. had to go? Uh, it would be so, really, really good to hear from. Oh, Richana. there she is. Are you able to to speak, Jane? Yes. Yeah, oh, I think so I think it's just fascinating listening to, to Michael and Yvette because I think there's so much that resonates. And I think the key thing is thinking about the indiv individualization of struggle compared to the collective impact of struggle in society and that local and sort of societal um, you know, dilemma of whether we start with ourselves as individuals but then the burden and how to manage that burden compared to when it's shared within a collective. So that, I think for, for me, uh, for Clock, and just listening to Mark and knowing that uh, there are so many students out there who've experienced and understood and listened to individuals' crisis, and then are thinking about how we can collectively address that struggle. And I know in Kishinas' work, it was all about the collective. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and I know Ranjana has been very active in the work that Krishna was doing in India with the Access to Justice strategy in India. And I wondered whether Ranjana would you'd like to say a few words, having been a student in Tata Institute of Social Sciences, where Krishna Das started his work, and now as Kiel. Kiel. Would you be able to share a few words, Ranjana? Um, yeah, thank you so much for bringing me in. Uh, mm -hmm. And first, I will. I would like to say that I am at Kiel just because of Professor Zain, because because of her I know Kiel, and it was lovely being uh, like being a student of this, which was started by her and her husband there. I was part of the Access to Justice program LLM in 2015 16, and after that, I was part of um, two years criminal justice fellowship 
and uh, then it was extended because my mentors liked my work with the communities I was working. So I was I worked eventually for three years, but but it is it is the sad state of affairs there because uh, the communities I am working with are 198 communities which were listed as born criminals in the Criminal Tribes Act 1872 during the British colonial and uh, they are though the act has been removed uh, re repealed in 1949 after independence but they are still being treated as the same and uh, they are still uh, they, they are now called denotified tribes but treated as born criminals till mm. date if any theft or any murder or anything robbery anything happens they are the first target without any suspension or anything so most of the working is um, like um, the mature is uh, uh, males are into jails from these communities uh, especially i know about the state of maharashtra mp and rajasthan because in rajasthan myself was working and in mp and maharashtra my mentor was working so and also the suicide rate among these family females are very high but that is never recognized or reported officially because uh, that is because of the torture by police because they either sexually harass them or financially torture them so they 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 just commit suicide to save their respect and uh, and their family but or they, they they just see that there is no way out if they live in this kind of life of misery so i don't know how to get out of this but uh, problem is that all those people who i have worked with like my mentors from People's Union for Civil Liberties and uh, my mentor from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, they are both blacklisted in the government uh, as Naxalites. They are both female activists and what they, the common um, notion of police is that females who speak English and who talk about uh, these indigenous communities or the uh, the tribal communities are Naxalists. So that is very ridiculous. And they they treat them very badly because in into jail, my mentor was attacked and uh, she was like, they, they, they tried to rape her and remove her clothes and touch her bad intention and that kind of thing happens if you talk about tribals and indigenous communities and indigenous communities are like recently the, the thing if you have heard of I don't know how much you have might be looking at Indian media but but recently what they are doing is earlier they have they have taken over the core area of uh, forests and uh, so that they can misuse the resources for their own purpose or or to give it to the corporate houses and that is how the core area of jungles have been ruined already and mm -hmm. that is how the wildlife has been ruined but now what they are doing is because in the surrounding area indigenous communities are living so they cannot directly target these indigenous communities under the human rights conventions and all because they have to show their reputation to the international community so they are just putting wildlife animals into that area so that in these indigenous communities remove on their own but where will they go in the name of development i have no idea but they they are losing like we are trying to create so-called habitats for wildlife but we are not at all taking care of ha habitats of the humans who are actually there and we try to convert them into the so-called mainstream life and there also they are not accepted like I have uh, worked with these communities for a decade, three years officially with Tata Institute. Otherwise, it was me and my, uh, I was working under guidance of my father because my father was working there for four decades now to get these communities. These are gypsies, like Roman gypsies. So to get them settled down at one place, but we 
our family is boycotted by the villagers for doing that so there is a lot of struggle like that but we don't see any way out because even i myself i have been lost many fir's against by police officers rather than like uh, because i was trying to get those um, people out of jail who were there uh, imprisoned uh, for no reason like under false charges or all those but they they have put fir's against me instead of uh, looking into the real cause i don't know how how the way out is but i really want to do that something for these communities and our our criminal justice system is like very much in the beginning stages and uh, we are also trying collectively through this and that uh, this this subject of these criminal tribes is taken uh, covered under the victimology subject so that they they can be considered as victims of the system so that it, it's this can be looked upon but it is still in the cold bag so that's all wow mm, that's quite a narrative mm. wow gosh i'm super impressed yeah. by someone that has such passion and you will find a way because you sound so determined and you've done so much already and just keep working my goodness me i think it's amazing isn't it yeah it really yeah. is amazing in such atrocious circumstances i mean i think this is the other thing actually things like this are really good because they're bringing sort of different parts of the globe right into our rooms right now you know and making us think further afield we're very often especially with mental health and suffering we tend to think more at home you know our immediate environment our immediate surroundings but actually being aware of what's going on you know socially mentally throughout the rest of the world is really important you know because we're all connected by poor mental health by by social struggles and and maybe we do need to treat it as a more collective thing yeah and, i mean you I know global globally share ideas it's stimulated um, uh, thoughts that i've had about <clears throat> over the last decade perhaps a bit more uh, that is international and that is i don't know how many of you are familiar with the peace brigades uh, they were set up in canada and uh, their objective is in fact to send uh, qualified usually lawyers observers to theatres of war and theatres of destruction. So in one particular case, because I knew the person who went, he, she was um, a, a lawyer journalist from, from London, who I knew quite well. And she joined up with the Peace Brigades to accompany forest workers in the Amazon, where Bolsonaro now and before, they've been demolishing uh, vast areas. It's an environmental disgrace. And of course, there's an election going on at the moment. But the points that everybody's making, she was making, because I said to her, uh, she, she was of mature years. She'd had her family. And I said, this is a huge risk. You're risking your life. And I said, you know, I, I'm fascinated. I'm not sure I could do that. I'd like to think I could. She said, well, if we don't stand shoulder to shoulder, in these situations, no use, you know, sitting at home and just talking about it. We've got to go and be there because not everybody can do that. But they did encourage large numbers of people. And in fact, it worked. They were not prepared, you know, to shoot workers in the presence of observers. Uh, they only like to do it when they can't be seen doing it. Now, I don't know whether the peace brigades are still functioning, but they were, again, a community based initiative which signed up people from countries all over the world and i think again if it ceased functioning then you know things like that need rejuvenating for people who are willing to give up time and energy and medicines on frontier very much like that that's exactly what they're doing and um we i tried to set up <laughs> uh avocat sans frontier but that i uh, wasn't quite so successful in doing it although it started off and there were people coming forward and it's really thinking again outside the box of ways in which we never mind the governments of the world or national government we can bring about a change 
and particularly I've spent a lot, uh, quite a lot of time in Palestine. I mean, if you want to see a nation with being bombed out of, out of out of the back of beyond, there they are. They don't have anything, but they're prepared to stand up for their civil rights. I'm not talking about sending rockets across boundaries. I'm talking about basic survival and ability to draw water, to grow olives and so on. And again, amazing courage. Uh, and it's born out of the fact that they know they're not alone. It's not just that their neighbours are helping them, but they know that somebody else over there is interested and communicates with them and says, we will support you, we will send you things. I mean, in a way, that's what the government's doing over the Ukraine business as well, which is a, another move. But I think that's that's what we have to do because governments on the whole won't do it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've blown her mind. No, no, no. <laughs> I think um, I, I hate I hate to do this, but I'm very conscious of time, and so I'm wondering whether there are any final sort of quick questions. There are a number of fantastic points in the in the in the comments in the chat. Can the um, chat be retained? I was going to ask that because there's been a lot of people like Simon. I think this is about the third or fourth one I've seen of you and I really want to respond. But I'm thinking there are so many that it's difficult to respond now or deal with them all. So if there's a way of capturing these and then we can perhaps respond to Alice and Alice, maybe you can distribute the responses perhaps. Yes, definitely. So we've so we've recorded the whole evening, the whole event. Okay. Um, and we will keep the chat as well. We can get that to you separately. But I think the other thing that's coming through in some of those most recent comments is that there's a real interest in, in finding ways to continue this conversation. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and to think mm -hmm. about, you know, some of the key themes that, that we've that we've talked about tonight about, well, the power of collective activism, really, and, and, and the, the, the ways in which we can support each other's mental health. Um, yeah. Those are those are conversations that I think we we would love to continue with, with you yeah. and with all of the people that are uh, that are on the uh, on the call this evening. Yeah, and I have a I have a little it's a sort of epitaph, really, mm -hmm. but I have a little um, aphorism which I'm using. It's going to be the title of a very short book that I'm about to try and get down to, and it's called "It Is the Power in People, Not the People in Power." <laughs> Perfect. And it could Wasn't be the more power timely. in the people. <laughs> yeah, power in the people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I must underwear. It couldn't be more timely. <laughs> I I think if that's okay, we will have to close now. I'm sure we could continue all evening long. I can see lots of wonderful comments um thanking you both. Uh, it's been an absolutely inspirational um session it really is I, I can't thank you enough I it's keel been, what does it it's keel it it's I, the keel know, effect the you, keel you've factor been, you've the keel difference you've been great friends to keel and and i know that uh, that friendship will continue for for many years yeah thank you and thank you thank you for hosting yeah thank you so much to everyone at keel and to everyone that's joined tonight it's uh um, yeah it's things it's things like this events like this that actually start that process of driving change and, and moving forward to better things for for everybody so yeah onwards and upwards onwards and upwards and upwards <laughs> it's so much better you should do more of it well, that's it's done the trick <laughs> do take care both of okay. you and thank you very much everyone Bye. for joining Bye.